Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Guccio, and I'm here on episode 500 of Epicenter with Felix Luch, Brian Crane, Meher Roy, Sunny Agarwal, and Felike Ernst. And today we're going to be, well, looking back on the last almost 10 years of Epicenter and also looking forward to the next 10 years of Epicenter. And, uh, yeah, discussing a number of things, including, you know, where we think the ecosystem is heading, um, things that, uh, we thought would have played out differently, but, uh, surprised us and, um, and also some, some exciting surprises. So let's get started. In a world increasingly driven by cryptocurrencies, having access to accurate and reliable data is crucial. Are you looking to build cutting-edge applications or websites with real-time cryptocurrency data? Introducing CoinGecko's powerful API, your gateway to comprehensive cryptocurrency information trusted by thousands of industry leaders, including Metamask, Chainlink, and Etherscan. CoinGecko, our sponsor for today, is the most comprehensive crypto data aggregator in the market, supporting more than 10,000 crypto assets, aggregating from over 700 different exchanges. Through CoinGecko's API, you can effortlessly retrieve up-to-date market data, including prices, trading volumes, market capitalizations, NFT market data, and much more. Whether you're building a trading platform, a wallet, a portfolio tracker, or a data analytics tool, CoinGecko's API has you covered. Join the growing community of developers who rely on CoinGecko's API to create innovative solutions that shape the future of finance. Visit www.coingecko.com slash API today and use the promo code EPICENTER to unlock an additional 10% off. CoinGecko's API, the ultimate tool to empower your crypto project. How's everybody doing? Pretty good. Uh, excited to be back again. Yeah, yeah Sunny, how long has you. it been since you've been on EPICENTER? Oh, when's the last time you did one of these? Well, it's technically only like two or three weeks because I was on one, oh, one right, with, yeah. on, at Avalanche. But before that, probably like over like six months. I mean, Sunny almost looks grown up now. <laughs> Osmosis ages you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine, but I, I feel like this is, I'm not the person who this question was intended for. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay, I can uh, I can go. Yeah, so, so some of you may have followed, like, you know, you're on Twitter, I was writing a little... So I, I was basically went to Bucharest for, like, a few days. This is, like, almost a month ago now, or three weeks ago or something, or maybe almost a month ago. And then I had started having this, like, stomach, intense stomach pain. And I had it sort of before, so I was like, ah, this is fine, it's just going to go away. Uh, but then it didn't go away. And so I ended up going to the hospital, and then it was like the appendix was inflamed. Uh, infected and then uh, and then it burst so then they had to do this uh, surgery so they basically made a big cut sort of like I don't know 30 centimeters in the um, you know the whole stomach and had to like clean out everything and um, yeah basically are there pictures of this by the way they are they are <laughs> so I was basically and then, then I was in the hospital for, one day for I'd a love to while. see this <laughs> yeah I mean I posted on Twitter uh, there is some no, no the pictures of you opened up not the pictures oh, of like opened after up. the no, operation I don't have any I don't have any pictures of that I think it was like three and a half hour surgery or something yeah and then I was basically in the hospital for around almost two weeks I think and yeah and now I'm back in Portugal and so I've been kind of recovering from that uh, lost like seven kilos or something uh, but but I'm, I'm okay now right so now it's basically just sort of you know getting on the recovery but everything's fine but yeah it was, it was a bit of an intense episode definitely and um yeah if you if you have, so lesson lesson here is if you have really intense stomach pain don't ignore it <laughs> 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 I mean, it, it got pretty tense for it got pretty tense for for at, at one moment i think like you were you were tweeting i think on the day after the episode uh after the the surgery that things were getting worse and you know, I, I I got the sense that you started perhaps fearing for your life. Like how how bad was it? Like how close were you to things becoming, you know, potentially quite dangerous? 
Yeah, it's sort of hard to tell. I mean, I think if you read about sort of the state I was in, you know, if, if it was like a hundred years ago, right? Like 90% of the people in that thing would die, you know, because basically uh, if you didn't have antibiotics, then I think uh, probably it would have died. Um, so now I, I guess it was kind of serious. It wasn't like... I, you know, I think they they didn't they did the, they diagnose it the right way and then they sort of treated it the right way. So I think it was okay. You know, definitely at some points the doctors were telling me like, "Oh, this is looking really bad" and and things like that. And of course, like you know, how how do you? Um, it's hard to sort of interpret it. I did have a lot of pain, right? I think the pain was actually the hardest thing to deal with, right? Because when you just have hours and hours and hours of like intense pain, at some point it gets like, you know, really wears you down. And uh, I mean, I remember going in, when I was going into surgery, I was like, okay, like maybe I die, right? Like who knows? Like, I mean, I don't know what the chance is, but so, and I, f I felt really, I felt actually quite the peace at the time. And I was sort of wondering, I don't know if it was just uh, all the painkillers I was on. I was like, okay, this is <laughs> was definitely slightly high on painkillers. So, uh... <laughs> But I, I felt reasonably at peace with the idea of like, okay, maybe I'll never wake up from this. Um, so yeah, who knows? Well, we're all super happy you woke up, right? Definitely, yeah. I'm, I'm glad we're getting all of this out because, um, you know, the last couple of weeks, when you go to conferences, people people come up to you and say, like, Friederike, is your co-host going to be okay? <laughs> and like literally, like at Edcon, I was probably asked like 15 times. Um, and Friederike, yeah, so, how, how do you answer so, that question? How, yeah, yeah, well, the first time I was like, oh yeah, poor Brian and so on. But, you know, after the third time, I was just like, yeah, he's going to be just fine. Can I tell you about Gnosis Chain? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so now I'm taking taking a bunch of time off, which is like so nice. Uh, so I, I think this is like, I mean, partially I think I'm still recovering, but I think partially also I just like really needed a break. And so this is sort of like a nice timing too. And I, I think it's going to, it's also nice that, you know, things are kind of in a good place. Course One is in a good place. You know, here we have, like, you know, lots of great people hosting podcasts. And uh, so I, I think it's, it's you know, it's fine at the moment for me to take some a, a bit of time off. So I'm going to take all of June off. And it's, like, really, really nice to just, like, do nothing for a lot. And also I had a bunch of traveling, uh, cancel all this traveling. And I, I think this whole rest is, like, super, super happy about it. And uh, do do you somehow uh, after this ordeal did you, did you have some some kind of you know important life realizations or anything like that that, that, that you know that that this uh, has sort of imbued on you or well I, I do feel like the sort of thing of like t just taking some time to like rest and chill and do nothing I think that's like something where I. You know, I mean, I could have, of course, done this anyway, right? They could have been like, okay, let me take off a month or something. Because, uh, but, you know, I sort of didn't, I didn't like allow myself to do that. You know, it was only because of like then getting ill that I sort of, so I, I do feel like that is one thing where I felt like, okay, I should be like maybe two years from now, I will maybe take off like another month or something, right? So I, I feel like, you know, I think, you know, if you think, like, let's say something like, okay, now you're building this company, then, you know, it's getting kind of gets like tiring over time, right? And exhausting. And I think a lot of people, right, when they build startups or they build, they build things, they, they want it to end because they're working, because they're just kind of always so semi burned out and exhausted, right? And then they're like, okay, I need to get some sort of exit or something. And, you know, like, and then, then finally I can rest. And I think that's obviously, you know, I mean, okay, maybe good in the sense that people work really hard, but also sort of like problematic because then you like, you know, you want the thing to end because he's so exhausted. It just makes it sound like people want to die. <laughs> They're looking for an exit and they <laughs> just want some rest. <laughs> I, I mean, I think this is so common. I think so, so many people, though you talk about like running startups, they're like, okay, I'm just like, you know, pushing so hard, trying to get there, trying to get there, you know, like yeah, I the just have to get to this finish line. 
I know it's completely unsustainable. Like I'm gonna like, but like you know, I'm gonna like two more years and then like sell this thing and like I don't want to like have anything to do this anymore. And you know, obviously that way you cannot you're gonna do something for like a long a longer time. And I think this kind of break is like super valuable for that. So I was also thinking, you know, like let's say a course one, if there's people who've been there for like years and years to like, you know, be great, right? For people to maybe encourage them to do things like that as well. Cool. Very cool. Well, uh, yeah, we're all glad you're doing better. And uh, I bet the employees at Chorus One are also happy that they'll probably get a, a month long break at some point. Well, you heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should discuss that in the way, anyway, but I, 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 think, I think that's a good idea, yeah. Cool. Well, uh, let's let's um, let's dive into uh, topics we had planned for today's episode. So, I think the first thing we wanted to discuss is, you know, I mean, I mean, maybe before we get into this, like, how does it how does it feel to everyone to be at five hundred episodes? You know, it, you know, it's just a, it it is just a number, and we kind of always have a host only episode at every you know significant kind of number we did this at 400 i think we did it at 300 as well yeah what how do you feel about it i think you and brian ought to answer this first right because <laughs> I mean, all the rest of us we yeah. weren't here from we, we we got we got we weren't here from episode one right so basically i think this kind of changes something whether you kind of join at episode 280 or whether you've always been there yeah no i mean i'm, I'm happy to share what I how I feel about it you know something so like yeah you know, as many people know I, I I was uh kind of running epicenter you know the company for a while and was kind of hosting a lot of episodes over over, over the last like like 2019 to to 2021 or something and uh and then took a bit of a step back to focus on other things so on interop ventures and, and nebula summit and, and and the interop which is my other podcast and um and I also during that 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 period, you know, like when you say like this kind of burnout feeling, I, I really felt kind of burned down, uh, burnt out around that time, um, and um, and taking a step back from it has really made me appreciate it a lot more. And so I I do appreciate like coming back and, and hosting episodes, uh, you know, on, on a semi regular basis. But also it's it's gotten me to appreciate just like the the importance of Epicenter sort of in in crypto culture. And it's something that when I was really in it, I wasn't sort of fully aware or I, I wasn't appreciating fully just how important Epicenter was to like so many people. And then it's having spoken with people about it over the last like two or three years that people are like, you know, like Epicenter really kind of was a part of my learning journey when I came into crypto or like I got rich because of Epicenter or I got, you know, I, 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 I got this job or like I met my co-founder through Epicenter and um and so, yeah, I've, I've kind of in the last couple of months or the last year, I've got like a renewed appreciation for, you know, what we've built here, um, but also, you know, the the um, the importance that it's had on the ecosystem, I think, to a lot of people. Yeah, definitely. It's always amazing to hear those stories. Uh, I feel like especially at like, yeah, I guess it happens a lot. Yeah, I hear, I hear it's this kind of stories often and it's definitely... Beautiful. I, I think the amazing thing for me is just that like such a long time, right? Like almost 10 years now. And, you know, it's not like, I mean, it's just one episode at a time. It's just like every week we're trying to like, okay, we got to do an episode, right? We got to do an episode. You got to do an episode. And then, you know, you keep doing it and keep doing it. And then you get to 500 at some point, right? So it's like, I think, you know, 500 episodes that would have seemed so like inconceivably large at 10 years seems like it's a crazy amount of time. But then, yeah, if you just, just keep doing it for years and years, then that's, that's sort of how you get. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Apart from brushing my teeth and like eating every day, I think it's the thing that I've been doing for the longest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> we still are at the state where we've only we've only missed one week in the entire five hundred, right? There's only like correct, like we've actually had like, wow, that's that is insanely impressive. Yeah, and I think this is also something that listeners don't always appreciate, right? That sometimes these episodes they're recorded just in time to be released that week. I mean, sometimes we have like a couple lined up already and we kind of we have them recorded and we can just release them as we go but uh yeah often it's um it's a lot of juggling yeah it's certainly a lot of juggling um 
So what, what what's uh, and Meher, you Meher and Felix, you, you've been uh, pretty quiet since the beginning here. Um, Meher, you've been here the longest after Brian and me. So uh, how does how does it feel to be here and still still coming on once in a while? Yeah, I mean, it's great. I I, I don't have any profound thoughts. I think like the crypto space has grown way faster than what I expected it to in terms of prices in the last 10 years while I've been at Epicenter. And um, it's grown way slower than actual usage than I thought it would. So in some ways, I think the the price to actual utility delivered is way out of whack than what I thought it would be in 2014. Yeah, so I guess like I'm, I'm happy to be in the crypto space and also like wishing that uh, we had much better product market fit found in the in the last ten years. So slightly disappointed also from the crypto space. I think I I know where you're coming from. I think if you look at the amount of tooling and the amount of infra- infrastructure and the amount of tools in the toolkit we have at our disposal now to build products, I think we're now really in a position to actually build products that are genuinely just um, a better user experience than their Web2 equivalents, right? So I think this is kind of, that's where we kind of need to get, get to to kind of for, for for crypto to actually have societal value. Right. I mean, so basically, you need to offer user experience that's strictly better what, than what was previously possible. And I think we're now starting to see like the first glimpses of what that may look like. And I think that's super exciting. Um, I also, I also think it's taken longer than I would have, I would have imagined at the time. So I totally see where you're coming from. But also, on the other hand, there were so many things we didn't think about that you know that just needed to be built and tried out and i i mean it's not like we as an ecosystem haven't done stuff for the last 10 years <laughs> yeah i i don't want to jump in here maybe briefly so i i can i this very much resonates with Meher is saying i mean when i got into crypto you know this was like the 2013 time when Bitcoin went, you know, from like, whatever, $70 to like a thousand something dollars at the end of the year. And, you know, you started to have main key, mainstream coverage of Bitcoin in the media, you know, and then it felt like, wow, this is really happening. People are like getting on board. And I was very sold on, you know, we are going to have, you know, this is going to go mainstream within the next, like, you know, two years or something, right? Like I was very... It felt like that. Uh, and I think that was a pretty common view at the time. And now it's, you know, like so many years later and like, you know, how many really like active crypto users are there? It's not a lot. And then but what we've had is this sort of the whole thing of, oh, you can issue a token and the token can sort of, you know, represent the future value and uh, people may not use it, but the token's worth a lot. So like... It gives you funding to invest in it, and and it's 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 fascinating how you've had basically this really substantial industry develop all based on you know future expectations. You know, there's basically very little you know real substance and usage and revenues in the entire space. And so like, oh, but we think it's going to happen in the future. Hence, we're going to value this token today. Hence, you know, you have now all these revenues and people can raise money and all these people and all of this but yeah i i I would not have expected that i did not see that coming and of course maybe it's it's great for all of us working here but also yeah it it is a bit disappointing that there's still like so little actual users do you think bitcoin like is it feels like the moment that bitcoin was like built for like is has started to come and is coming. Like, I, I feel like we're entering this world of like de dollarization, at, at least entering this like multipolar currency world. Uh, you see, like, you know, the whole BRICS stuff happening, like, you know, a lot of countries moving away from dollar based commerce. And, you know, this is even like earlier this year, you had like banking system, like, 
uh, shakiness and stuff. Like it feels like all the problems that Bitcoiners have like pointed out are like coming true. But do you think Bitcoin is actually in a position to like capture any of this? Like China has been buying so much gold in the last like one year, basically. Like if you look at the how much they've been increasing their gold supplies, but like you know, wasn't this what Bitcoin was meant to come in and do? And like, and if, and what is, why do you think Bitcoin has actually failed to step in and take on that role that it was designed to? Banks. Banks don't like it. <laughs> Look, I mean, Bitcoin and, and crypto and the project of crypto is, is political. It's like inherently political. And it, I mean, we, we should always remember that. And it is, um, threatening the the power of institutions whether that's like governance government institutions but also financial institutions that are you know in many places very close to government so i think um that you know in a nutshell is sort of like you know the, the sort of bastardized uh explanation of why but uh yeah at, at a high level i think that sort of covers it in my 10 years in the crypto space, I have essentially come to the conclusion that the Bitcoin vision is kind of wrong. So what I mean is, yes, de-dollarization will happen. Yes, major banking crisis will happen. But I don't think Bitcoin is the beneficiary of either of these trends to the extent that we think it is. Like sometimes we imagine it, you know, $5 million per coin. Um, it won't go to go to that extent. And my realization is that the argument for why Bitcoin should be a beneficiary of, let's say, a big debt crisis or um, currency, people losing trust in currency is usually that A, it's either like a store of value, something that will hold value over the long run, or B, um, it is like a transactional, is a transactional unit. In the transactional unit domain, uh, Bitcoin's volatility prevents it from being a great transactional unit. Meaning, and the 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 perfect illustration of it was in geopolitics. It happened like a few months ago, when um, so these days there's like the USSR, sorry the Russia. Nobody won't. Lots of countries don't want to buy oil from Russia. India is kind of bucking the trend. India is buying oil from Russia, converting that into uh, products and selling it to the West again, and it's pocketing it a difference. And India and Russia are kind of like negotiating what currency shall India pay Russia with. And India wants to pay with the Indian rupee. And Russia doesn't want to take the Indian rupee. And the reason for Russia not wanting to take the Indian rupee is it can take a lot of Indian rupees, sure, but then what will it buy with Indian rupees? It can only buy Indian products and it doesn't have a lot of demand for Indian products. So it's like the economy that actually is the most productive, you want to hold the currency of that economy from, for transactional purposes, which is why people hold US dollars. And if the US declines in power, whatever is the next productive geopolitical area of the world, that will work even as a transactional currency. Now, if you think of store of value, people think, okay, Bitcoin is a great store of value, but I've also realized that um, equity indexes are the best store of value. So if you go and think of an equity index, S&P 500, it's backed by actual human productive power, great products, great business models, a mix of them. And they, they, they churn out based on what, what is good and what is not. And that is a much more stable foundation for a long-term store of value than, than a crypto coin. Um, and so I think... Uh, index-based stores of value, which might come from the stock market, or it might even come from crypto, right? An index of crypto coins, each of which have great business models. I think there are going to be those things that are better stores of value. And so I am 
no longer a Bitcoin convert on either of these dimensions. But, but that but that's true that like you know on yes uh, an index of all tokens is like a actually outperforms markets generally and like or you know in this current historical trend. But gold is still the highest value market cap asset in the world, and like by like you know almost an order of magnitude. Uh, and so how like so I don't think Bitcoin ever claimed to be like uh, of a placement like a productive asset or anything. It was always, or at least you know for a long for at this point like approaching seven eight plus years at this point right like yeah in the early days i think bitcoin was trying to find what is its purpose kind of thing but now you know it, it, we've been in this world long enough where it's settled like we are trying to build digital gold that's it what like the question is why has bitcoin failed to come close to gold or, or, or you can argue that it hasn't right you can argue that like you know gold is a 12 trillion dollar asset market cap bitcoin is a half trillion dollar market as a cap the fact that we're within like an order of magnitude is actually come kind of impressive but uh so may, you know maybe you can argue that we haven't failed yet but like um why have like do you still believe that bitcoin will be able to replace gold as an asset one day or no i i guess two things so first of all like why hasn't bitcoin sort of taken on this role and and you know the dollar and and those kind of things well, I mean, I do, you know, the whole Balaji's argument and all of that, I do agree that there is some sort of de-dollarization that's going to happen. And I do agree that, you know, eventually the U.S. dollar is going to, you know, collapse, right? I think it's just like, it's obviously unsustainable with the debt levels and all of that. However, when it comes to the time horizon of this, I don't believe it's very close. And I, I think in the end, it's still like, it's still stable enough, the dollar, and it's still something that you, is extremely useful because it's, you know, because you can, you can use it to trade. And for most people in other fiat currencies, well, like if I can like put my money in the dollar, like that's pretty good, right? So it, it's like a better store of value than Bitcoin because it's like, uh, more useful and then it's more more stable from a price perspective so i i think like when would be the time when you know you really see bitcoin thrive well i mean maybe if the dollar really struggles but that seems far away uh and you know maybe you have some other advantages of course right like where maybe if it's like sanctions and you're outside of banking system you have control of your assets so i think there are some of those advantages but of course a lot of people may not care that much about it, right? Because they can get a US, like, I don't know, if you're in Argentina and you can get a dollar account uh, somewhere else and you can access it well, then maybe that's good enough for you. Uh, you know, whether whether Bitcoin is going to replace gold in the longer run, I, I think it's possible, but I still think that, you know, Bitcoin has unique risks that i mean of course maybe gold has risk with maybe like asteroid mining or something but bitcoin also has risks right the bitcoin has this whole thing about you know the uh, you know the bitcoin's mind the you know the inflation block rewards going down with the halving and you know you don't really have transaction fees replacing that or like you know hold the the long-term economic security to me for or bitcoin feels a bit like you know I don't know. I'm not totally comfortable with it. So, and and of course, so for a lot of people, also just crypto still has too negative of a um, image, right? It's like they see Bitcoin and they think, well, crypto, it's volatile, it's you know, criminals, money laundering, buying drugs online, a bunch of scammers, Gary Gensler doesn't like it, you know, like, is that, so does that feel like a good alternative to gold? I think a lot of people will probably not see it that way because of that. So I think there's still a lot of obstac obstacles that I see. I, so I'm with Meha on the S&P 500 thesis. I also think, I mean, so basically, also, if you look at the market cap of the S&P 500, it's um, several times that of gold. I think maybe like five times or so that of gold, maybe 
little bit less. But to to me, the question um, is is uh, in the de-dollarization, uh, basically not when is gold or when is Bitcoin gonna replace the dollar, uh, but when are stable coins gonna or you know baskets of stable coins or um, you know somewhat stable assets devised that way through through clever basketization. Um, when is that gonna uh, gonna come? Because that seems like closer. Do you guys agree? I gave a talk yesterday at the Gateway Conference about a Terra one year retrospective since the crash. And in that I basically, you know, I there was a period there where I was like highly convinced that like Terra had the potential to become like a global like currency. Eventually it would like depeg from the dollar, like, you know, ha- follow some more floating uh, exchange rate kind of thing. Uh, but like after that whole system collapse and, you know, the, I have all these, all this, re- you know, when I talk, I talk about the, all the reasons that happened, but like, I don't know, I, I feel a little bit sad that no one's actually work. Like, there's very little work being done on um, these like under like 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 algo stables and stuff since then like it feels like it's almost like yeah uh, everyone's scared to even like talk about it and like i i think that's not great i think we do need to if if we do want to build like decentralized money decentralized stable coins we do need to figure out like open up the conversation again about like you know how do we build under collateralized algo stable systems yeah i fully agree I think the issue with uh, with the stable coins today is just that they're basically all backed by you know dollars in U.S. bank accounts, and I think that's just so easy to control. So I don't think there's any way that the current type, I mean, the current type of stable coins, like hopefully they can keep existing because they're super useful. They're great, right? Uh, and you know they can be a great sort of. Uh, transaction media, but then uh, they're really more of a like payment, different payment rails than anything else, right? To, and and I think they can never be, you know, the U.S. financial system will never allow them to get to a threatening state. And I think it, they can easily prevent that because they can just freeze the assets in these banks and go after these banks. And so I I think they're not the current stablecoins are not really. And they're not a viable, they're not building a viable alternative. And I think for a viable alternative, we do need to have a really decentralized system. I mean, I like Sunny. I was, you know, I was very bullish on Terra, of course, also very wrong about it, right? Um, but I, I think the idea was just enormous. And then I think that idea needs to be pursued in some way. Maybe it has, I don't know if it, if it, if like fully collateralized, maybe, maybe that can work or maybe it needs to be under collateralized, but maybe the, not with the same mistakes that Terra made. I'm not totally sure, but I do think those experiments need to happen and, and we need like different types of stable coins. So what have we learned from the Terra collapse? Like, oh, maybe, maybe just giving an essence, uh, essence of your talk. I think that, so, you know, when there was this like really good post, like a blog post, like from like 2018 or something where he talks about like the goal with a stable coin is to like build a real economy around it. And like, he talked about like, oh, if you like build a payment system that like drives continuous demand for it, you have to like get people to like, to start denominating debts, like business debts in the, in this stable coin. That's how you get like you know, fiat remains stable because you have this like perpetual demand for the system, uh, for, 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 the, for the token, the currency. Um, and that's what like, I think Terra had started to build, like that's what the whole Chai stuff was about. Um, you know, obviously now in retrospect, it's unclear how much of that was fraudulent, like real or not. Like, I guess there's all these like court cases going on about that. Um, but then like, you know, they had started building a real DeFi economy around it that was getting demand. But then like eventually with, they just got greedy, I think at some point, like instead of like taking it, like had it, having this like actual, you know, sustainable growth that they were seeing, they like the anchor scam came along and basically told everyone to hold like a UST in this pool for 20% yield. 
and like it was not real yield it was just being subsidized by like uh tfl and anchor emissions and like uh being propped up basically and then what happened was as soon as things got a little shaky everyone went running for the door no one was there for like actual demand they were just like everyone just exited from anchor there's all the issues like first of all like anchor should have probably had some rate limits or something but everyone just went running for the door and anchor also had this like along with like having everyone hold ust for like this fake yield it actually had this like uh bad effect where it caused it made it harder for people to build real economies around it so we, you know there was an episode or episode with Mick mars a couple of weeks ago and like the you know mars was originally on terra they were had their own lending protocol but they struggled to get deposits because they had to compete with the 20 percent yield from anchor and so it's like not only was it like creating this fake economy it was actually parasiting the like real DeFi economy that was being built around ust um and so i don't know like what did we learn that like stable coins propped up by ponzi algo farms don't work like don't work but it's like no shit like obviously uh so th th that's the part that i find the most disappointing right like we did we didn't learn anything new and it just like soured the ecosystem for everyone that it's like now the sentiment is so against algo staples even though the original experiment of building a demand driven crypto economy like was never tested properly right it kind of ties back to the whole infrastructure phase and real business running on the networks i think in the end, Terra was too early because there was nothing like that. And I guess this ultra Ponzi nomics that like made it scale way too quick and then in its collapse, I think right now, I guess you, you first need these real businesses to be on chain, right? And I, I guess then you can have a decentralized stablecoin. I don't think it's necessarily like a design flaw or like you can somehow fix this with design. You really need like economy to migrate on chain. Uh, like purely the better stablecoin design won't fix it, right? So I think it's just, a, it will take some time. And I do actually think that over collateralized stablecoins, like even like Maker, right? is quite nice design. It's not as scalable, but maybe it doesn't need to be. Uh, and when the demand is there, maybe when there are real world assets on chain and more than it, it will be scalable enough at that point, it could sort of be a theory. I, I'm not like super convinced if there is like some algo stable that like purely by design can fix this, these issues personally. You need circles. Circles seems like the answer here because I mean, so basically these mutual credit lines that basically circles in effect is, it lets you create money locally in groups um, and kind of uh, move it along relationships that exist. And I think that's super valuable. So I think, I think algo staples with a central issuance, those will, I mean, if, if we'll see them, my thesis would be that we will see them later. And first we will see like localized versions. Yeah, I, I that kind of resonates with me. I, I feel like, you know, one, one of the things that we, if you remember Fredeka, the, the first time we interviewed, um, it wasn't Doe, but it was his his previous co-founder on, on epicenter daniel daniel right we we walked out we walked away from that episode thinking that the terror was was not sustainable because it relied on this hypothesis of of uh perpetual growth uh, and perpetual demand in order to, f to fuel its growth and and stability and um i wonder if at least currently or in the sort of current ecosystem if it is even possible to create like enough uh, demand to sustain a, a stable coin, but like, but I mean, what what would that demand come from? You know, is it DeFi? And DeFi, if if you think it's DeFi, then I think that's sort of inherently flawed because like I mean, DeFi is sort of built on all these kind of pillars that are also a little bit, you know, Brian was talking about, or someone was talking about this earlier about how sort of you know there is no usage behind. Uh, behind behind much of the activity i feel like what circles hits at is it hits at real world economy sort of like tangible you know you can sort of touch it hold it in your hands eat it uh drink it uh use it to sustain you sort of uh economies that that are that are necessary for uh, a currency to exist and maybe 
the algorithmic stable coins of the future will be baskets of those types of ecosystems, right? Like Circle and something else similar to it. Yeah, I, I do feel like that's, um, I mean, if you want to be cynical about it, um, th the stable coin that so far has found product market fit is Tether and the use case is tax evasion. Um, I think, I mean, it's a little bit, maybe it's a little bit too stock. Nah, but... I mean, it's not the use case of, I mean... Yeah, there's a lot of Tether usage, like, globally, like... But have you, know... you tried to cash out Tether? No, but... Yeah, but it's really, really difficult. It's difficult to, 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 to cash but out. I don't know that... what that has to do with tax. I mean, I mean, Tether is used so much for all kinds of stuff. Like, it doesn't sound right to me what you're saying. If, if, what's interesting is, if you look at the Tether stats on the Tron blockchain, right? Like, they have, like, what, like, $50 billion of Tether on there? Like, yes, 80% of it is in exchange accounts, but actually, like, 20% is, like, in, like, tail-end wallets and that are, like, making, like, daily transactions. Uh, like, there is actually an entire, like, real, like, you go to Thailand, there's, like, street merchants accepting Tether. You go to Colombia, there's, like, ATM, like, Tether ATMs where people can, like, convert Tether to, like, cash. And it's, like, as much as we like to meme on Justin Sun, he's actually been, like, building a real, like, payment rail system like globally with on, on Tron and Tether. Like obviously it'd be nice if it wasn't in a centralized stablecoin. It was actually in like a more decentralized thing. But like the actual like, hey, you know, what what most people care about right now in the world is like, you know, like like I thought we were saying Brian maybe, but like, you know, not getting their hands on gold, but it's like getting their hands on like dollars. Like most people in the world in third world countries just want access to dollars and like Tether and Tron have actually been doing that pretty successfully. Why do you think it's Tether and not, say, USDC? Because, so I've talked a lot to the Tether team about this, and they actually, like, about the tail end stuff, right? And their claim is it's actually, they weren't very involved with it. It's actually been mostly, like, the Tron, like, team that was, like, leading this, like, effort. And so, uh, I don't know, just good execution skills i think tether just happened to be on tron like accidentally like there was like this uh like why did it end up being tether and not usdc uh was just a uh, tether came first it had more liquidity and then a lot of people were use like you know the tron team like spent a lot of time like making sure that like getting all exchanges to do tether transfers via tron and then from there they expanded into like more retail payments like if USDC existed at the time, like I, th that's the whole thing. I think that th that's what like Binance was trying to do with BUSD. The problem with USDC is there's like not a global distribution rail for it. What Binance was trying to do with BUSD was basically Tether. Yes, like you know, it is sketchier than like your you like your actually regulated stable coins. Binance was trying to take a regulated stable coin by Paxos. And then use the Binance system to like as a global distribution rail for like how do we get this like better, more secure stable coin than Tether in the hands of people globally. And of course, obviously that got like shut down basically effectively by the government. But like that is, I think, what they were trying to do. So uh, we, we had here in the rundown that we would talk about, you know, which project uh, had we, we think had the most significant pivot. And I feel like this sort of Covers that, uh, I guess. I guess Tether for for a lot of us, uh, or sorry, uh, Terra for a lot of us was was that project. What about things that you were super excited about that have faded out or ceased to exist? Um, I know Federica, you had some ideas here of projects that you were interested in over the years that have faded out, or maybe you were surprised faded out. Any thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, basically, it's just sometimes you speak to a team and you just immediately see the value of that project and you think, oh, yeah, I would totally use that and I will use that. And then you kind of, it just fades out and you never hear from it again. Or you, it basically, I, I think the, the example that I made was Dharma. Um, at the time, it just seemed so novel and then basically they pivoted to... Um, a multi-sig wallet, and I and I be, before we recorded this episode, I said I I wonder what happened to them. I haven't actually thought about them for a long time, 
um, and uh, someone said they were acquired by OpenSea. Um, yeah, it's it's just sometimes um, sometimes it just plays out differently than you thought. And I was wondering um, whether you had any of those moments re recently. I, I had one, which is an app I was using a lot during COVID. And actually, they were they were sponsoring this show for a while. It was Pepo, was this kind of crypto TikToks like thing that was on the OST chain or by the OST team. And um, they, yeah, they were around for like, I think two or three years or something like that. And they were trying to build, uh, they were trying to build out this, this kind of crypto version of, of TikTok. And uh, there were a lot of like cool content creators there, like just sort of very like niche people, met a few folks there as well. Uh, but yeah, then they decided to just like shut it down and pivoted and you know, Jason uh, Goldberg, who's running that project, is now doing some kind of like online gym or something like that. <laughs> but um, yeah, that that was one one recent ex one recent example. Yeah, I don't. I I'm not gonna say anchor. <laughs> no, um, like I guess for me, it's probably like the some of the scaling solutions or some of the initial ideas, like Plasma or even Truebit. I was like just looking back at the episodes, sort of when I started to listen to Epicenter around like 150 or something and sort of fascinated about these initial ideas of scaling and sort of how it developed into what we have today, like roll-ups and, and this kind of designs. Obviously, like some of the early designs sort of just faded or, or uh, teams even dissolved or got to work somewhere else. I, I guess I would probably mention those where I was like, pretty bullish on but that specific project for example didn't make it like 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 a true bit I mean, actually, they kind of ended up inspiring the like all the optimistic roll-ups that are being built today but yeah right idea wrong time i guess for me what's really interesting is how hard it is to disrupt the the tcp ip http stack and one can see that in kind of like the struggles IPFS has, or I mean, I think the struggles Orbit will have. All of these um, projects that are trying to reinvent like networking and like data transport around the web, they haven't done as well as I thought they would. I mean, you see IPFS being used in some dApps, but then there will be like, you'll come across a cutting edge ecosystem and it will have nearly zero IPFS penetration with all the wallets being traditional centralized wallets. Uh, it, it kind of reinforces how how sticky the, the current web stack really is. For me, I think the one that, uh, you know, as people might remember, I was like huge on Interledger and I was like really excited about like the you know, hey, let's build a generalized payments protocol that will span across all the chains. Like, and, you know, I don't know, a lot of reasons I think the project didn't really succeed. Like, I think one, it was trying to do too much at the same time. It was trying to be like a payment channel network as well as like an exchange system, as well as like a crop, like a bridging kind of protocol. And it was trying to do all this stuff into in, in one thing at the same time. And, so I don't know. I think like learning from that is like important. Like okay, maybe don't try to do too much in in one stand protocol. And obviously, I do think that the Ripple Association is part of what killed it. Where like you know, I it came from out of the Ripple team, and like because of that, it just didn't get the political will from other ecosystems to like really put effort behind it. You know, I talked to a team recently, and they were like, "We're building on." On uh, on Interledger, <laughs> I was like, "What? That thing is still around?" And yeah, I guess there's some like some usage in Latin America or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, one one project that came to my mind maybe it was like Radical. So Radical was like trying to do this uh, decentralized GitHub alternative, which also seemed like you know such a big need. Uh, you know, I think for. At one point, there was a lot of discussion about this, right? Because you'd have projects that would be, you know, kind of decentralized, like Bitcoin, for example, this is a big topic, right? Where you have like, of course, a very decentralized network, but then the code is all run or hosted on a centralized platform, GitHub, where you have, you know, a bunch of like 
uh, maintainers that, you know, obey these roles controlled by the GitHub company that end up having a lot of power. So like, you know, it's, and then of course other things, right, where like GitHub will like exclude people from certain jurisdictions, you know, like if you're Iranian, you can't use GitHub and stuff like that. So it did feel like, you know, that that would be a cool idea to do a sort of, you know, decentralized alternative to it. But then, and I think, you know, the team was pretty strong like that. But then somehow I think it didn't manage to do it. Uh, I mean, it's still around to some extent, but I don't know. You don't hear much about it. And are you bullish on Gitopia? I I don't know Gitopia. I have no idea. Yeah, I was just gonna bring that up. Gitopia is a project that's like doing the same, like similar thing, like GitHub, like a decentralized version of GitHub, and actually in my opinion doing it correctly like I, I i was on the episode you know i was did the episode with radical and i, I was i was actually always like very skeptical about the approach that they were taking where arguably it was a bit too radical where like their take on like software development was that like master branches are a source of centralization and like we have to get rid of master branches we have to go to a world where like back to when everyone had their own personal branches and we're all like merging patches amongst each other and it's like no like that's not actually how like real software development gets done and like i think like yeah i think radical was trying to like shove this like weird esoteric like software development philosophy baked into the model of their system and i think that was the problem i think so what gitopia is doing is actually doing it correctly which is like taking the infrastructure that 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 github has done in a very centralized way and actually just moving that onto a blockchain so i don't know, i'm personally really excited about gitopia like it's i think it's radical done right yeah, and the other thing that's cool about Gitopia is that it incorporates, or at least they they want to incorporate all this this kind of like DAO tooling within the system, so that you know you can essentially sort of have your Git repo be managed by a DAO. And what I'm really looking forward to here is like when all of this tooling is built in a kind of one click uh, system, where like if you're launching a blockchain project, you can just go to Gitopia or like some interface built on top of it, say, I'm looking for like this kind of structure, like I want to be like Benevita d- dictator or I want my my project to be run by a DAO or like some other model or some c- kind of custom multi-sig or whatever. And like within one transaction, you can start the DAO, you can distribute the tokens, you have the Git repos, you have like all the permission to access and it's just like, it just becomes a default for any crypto project that's starting. They're not going to go to GitHub, they're going to go to like to Gitopia and, and sort of get started there. I think that would be really powerful. Super nice. Before we move on to another topic, could I take another thing that faded out? So wh- one of the weird things that for me, like faded out, but then is reborn like a phoenix in the ashes is the idea of the private corporate blockchain or the blockchain or the private enterprise blockchain, which has this, from my perspective, weird story of um, the bear market of 2017 hits and suddenly it's all the vogue. There are companies, Digital Asset, R3C, V, Eris, uh, Hyperledger has a bunch of projects, all of them trying to build blockchains for the enterprise. And as far as I can see, none of those applications have ha- have, have really stuck. And that initial idea that you can build blockchains without a crypto coin, uh, and then those blockchains would be used by insurance companies and big banks, kind of faded out and became much smaller than the noise at that point in time. What's really weird is that idea, I think, is being reborn in the end of space. So when you look at like Coinbase base, well, isn't that really an enterprise blockchain? It's like built by built by Coinbase. Their vision is to onboard 80 million users of Coinbase onto that blockchain. It's going to have a centralized sequencer. It's an L2 to Ethereum, so it's using these crypto economic mechanisms, but it feels awfully like an enterprise blockchain, and I think there's going to be more of them like that. So I think that idea may again reappear with the big qualifier that those enterprise blockchains will be built by crypto native enterprises. So that's kind of like a a weird story that has existed in our space. 
Yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, there's there's also like another version of this that I've seen uh, like one or two examples of, and that is uh, products projects building with the Cosmos SDK with the hopes that uh, industrials will become validators. So one example is a project that I know, of course, one you guys I think invested in is Sorchain. And so they're building a decentralized network for basically vehicle data. It's like a vehicle data market. And so there's like this whole industry, like this whole kind of like vertical that's emerging around vehicles sharing data with each other and with infrastructure, et cetera. And there, there is no kind of, you know, decentralized infrastructure to incentivize uh, that data to be uh, shared with uh, with the with sort of like the greater network. And they're working with auto manufacturers and parts manufacturers. And one of their ambitions, I think, is to have, you know, the Fords and Toyotas of the world be validators on this network. And, you know, when we at Stratum were working on permissionless con- kind of, or permission consortiums, back in back in those days back in 2016 2017 and onwards you know that was the idea the idea was we're going to create these use cases that corporations will want to uh hop on board and and become validators in these networks uh, but i think that the technology wasn't quite there yet maybe the understanding that crypto economics are an important aspect of um sort of maintaining incentives in the system so happy to see that those types of use cases are kind of coming back. And the nice thing about the Cosmos SDK is that it can start as kind of permissioned and become permissionless over time. And IBC enables some of that as well. So it's, it's a, it's, it's a, a sort of, you know, network architecture that I'm quite, quite bullish on. And I wish like, you know, the Interchain Foundation would spend a little bit more time doing business development around um, this kind of thing. Maybe let's change gears and talk about the converse. So every now and then, there are niches in this ecosystem that grow way faster, become way more useful than we would have thought like even a couple of months before they kind of exploded onto the scene, right? So basically, one thing I'm thinking about, for instance, is um, CKP technology, right? So basically, if you look at how much it's kind of shaped what we think the ecosystem can do over the next couple of years, it's enormous, right? Another thing is AI. So let's talk about these. The, with the thing with AI, here, here's what's, what's kind of funny about, about like the whole AI and blockchain uh, topic is that once again, like this, this is a topic that has kind of done a 360 because, or maybe a 180. <laughs> because a couple of years ago, like you know, in, in the last cycle, you know, people would talk about AI and blockchain and like, it was just kind of this like kind of weird cringe topic that we all thought, you know, wasn't going to amount to much. And it was just sort of like buzzwords that people would put on a pitch deck to raise funds and, you know, lots like teams did raise funds, but, but now it actually starts to make sense, you know, like of the last three episodes we did on the interop, you know, the topic of AI and blockchain was kind of central to that, to those episodes. And, you know, Sunny, we did an episode with, um, with Amin of, uh, of Avalanche and they're, putting a large language model in in a blockchain so that you don't have to run code anymore. You can just sort of tell it what to do and it will send those instructions to, to validators. Um, Akash Network is uh, working on a decentralized marketplace in which, you know, amongst you know, other types of, of uh, execution uh, resources would also be the GPUs uh, that, you know, people could use to, to train models. So that the topic of AI and blockchain is coming back in a really big way and I think like in a really relevant way. So yeah, curious. I know Mayor, you, you, this is a topic you've been sort of spending a lot of time researching. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that too. So I've I've kind of followed this topic for six or seven years. In fact, the if you look at the classic articles for AI and blockchain, they are written by Trent Mc, McConaughey, where he has a series called Wild Wooly AI DAOs. And I think 2016, 2017 and I'm actually cited in, in, in the blog. So shout out to Trent. Shout out to Trent. <laughs> I've kind of gone to, uh, I, I kind of followed a lot of these, these projects. And I think like the, and I think that the one major idea here is, okay, can you use, can you train AI models on, on hardware that is kind of incentivized in, by some crypto network. So that's, that's one idea that is, that is very prominent. I actually don't know how successful it is going to be. Um, in fact, I, I'm not highly convinced about it. 
So in general, AI and blockchain is very hard to mix. And it is so even now. Um, I don't think GPTs have changed a lot. But what I do suspect crypto could deliver the AI space in a very powerful fashion is when you have AI agents that end up becoming very powerful, the only way to contain them starts to be zero knowledge technology or blockchains. So, um, so imagine like, um, Imagine you have like an AI agent that is as that's as intelligent as a, as a human, right? And you want to jail that AI agent in some way. When, by jail meaning you want to restrict it from doing certain things. The problem is that if if you as a developer are developing such an agent, and there are there are some examples like that, then because you're fundamentally building software that is as intelligent as you it can always escape into the broader internet and it can it can replicate and you can have very little control over it so how do you have how do you exercise control over an agent over a piece of software that is as intelligent as you are this is what is called the alignment problem uh, in the ai space and i think the point at which ai and blockchain are going to merge on a very in a powerful way is the way you actually control a highly intelligent AI system is that the entire execution of that AI agent continually uh, outputs some kind of zero knowledge proofs. And for example, if you want to have a kill switch on an AI agent, so I assume that there's an AI agent that is extremely intelligent. The minimum thing I want is to install a kill switch into that AI agent that when I say die, I can make it die with 100% guarantee and the AI agent cannot break the kill switch itself because if the AI agent can break the kill switch then it can leak out into the world uh, and replicate across the internet so how do you implement a guaranteed kill switch that's a type of alignment problem and I think the answer to it is you have to write an AI agent inside like an orbit or inside like a ZK EVM like computational platform where, where you can write the kill switch as some kind of logic with, which has a zero knowledge proof. And as the computer executes, there are guarantees that the kill switch isn't disabled. So when you think of this problem of extremely intelligent systems, verifiable software is going to become really important. And what we are fundamentally developing via the mechanism of zero knowledge proofs is actually verifiable software fundamentally. And I think like that's why I think there is an intersection in the future. I mean, this makes sense to me, but like, what, how do you deal, like when you have open source models and like that, you know, how do you force things to, to have kill switches built in, right? Like I, that's that, I think that's the, concern issue i have with this like idea so you can have an open source model right uh, the model is just code uh, or it's it's the weights of a network and it is open source the thing that is dangerous is not the model itself but actually a running version of the model right it's if somebody something has to be executing making calls to the model and it has to be executing as a as a process, and it's that process that is that can be dangerous. And how do you have any kinds of limitations posed on a running computer process that is as intelligent as you are? You want a verifiable kin switch or ver verifiable power limitation switch, and I think like that is fundamentally what crypto provides. But Meher, so to me. I mean, so the kill switch idea to me makes sense, but how do you know when to press it, right? So basically, to me, the danger would be that kind of the AI just outsmarts you and it looks harmless, but uh, in, in the backhand it actually makes something malicious because it knows in principle you can shut it down. So, I mean, it's a cat and mouse game, no? 
Exactly. You are saying you want an auditable log out of the AI agent. Whatever the AI agent does, it has to guaranteed appear into a log that you can see and analyze with a different system. That's another verifiable computation problem. Guaranteed printing of a log. That's a crypto problem. That's a ZKB problem, I think. So this, is, this is what I suspect is going to be our value proposition to, to that field. Do you think, so basically, I recently spent a lot of time also re reading about AI stuff. Do you think this is going to be the end of all of us at some point? Because basically, so there's so many ways it could in principle go wrong. Um, and basically dealing with something that is just, you know, inherently more powerful than you are yourself, it may just be, it's probably impossible to contain at least um, reliably. And I mean, there, there only have, <laughs> has to be one hiccup. Right, um, and it's uh, it it that may well spell the end of all of us. So, do you see that danger? And if so, what do we do against it? I recently heard a, a couple of people say that they think our only way to kind of survive this is kind of just upgrading ourselves too with kind of Neuralink um, type technology. I don't buy that. Um, but basically, the question is, as someone who's actually thought about this a lot, do you think we're in any sort of real danger? So, so this is this is essentially known in various places as the control problem and like the alignment problem. The control problem being is like, how do you place restrictions on something that is smarter than you can replicate across the internet? Right, like so. If, so if you if you're running it on some computer system, and that running agent is kind of smarter than you are, it can always kind of jailbreak and go to the internet and start running on some other hardware. So how do you place uh, restrictions on it? Is 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 one highly important problem, and then the other problem is kind of when you're not placing restrictions on it. Uh, for, for some reasons, right? Like you need to do it a certain task and it is making autonomous decisions. Then how do you make sure that those autonomous decisions are kind of in alignment with what your original desires were? And kind of these are, these are unsolved problems, right? And there are many people in the world that believe Humanity won't be able to solve these problems on a on the time scale at which we will build systems more smarter than us. So the fundamental problem being that we will build things as intelligent as us before we know how to control or align them. And that timing mismatch is what dooms us or dooms human civilization fundamentally to end. And the end being defined in in various various ways some people would literally define it as every human dying others defining it as some combination of ai is becoming the dictators of of humanity etc so it's an unsolved problem if you just look at how in the last you know 6 months large language models have become um so prevalent, like you know, all, every, everybody uses ChatGPT for some for something, right? And and lots of startups are now being used, uh, are, are now using uh, ChatGPT or sort of large language models and, and GPT models to uh, to create new products. None of these products are being designed with these sorts of containment models um, in mind, right? So they're they're being built as SaaS products, and people are using them, and you know they're. They're in your call recorder software or they're in like, you know, tomorrow they'll be like reading your email and, you know, giving you some advice about how you should be responding to your email or perhaps even responding to your email for you. Like these, these things are coming and they're coming fast. None of these products have this containment in mind. And so why would at some point, like, you know, in, in a year from now or three or five years from now, when these systems have 
uh, infiltrated our lives, right? And we're, we're using them and we're talking to Siri and like Siri is now basically like GPT, right? And why would at that point containment models um, uh, start? It, it would be it would be so difficult and I think like practically impossible that at that point to um, to incorporate containment models. So I think, you know, the, the odds of this going wrong are fairly high. Although I love GPT, you know, it's great. I actually, I, I'm, I'm an optimist and I believe and I, and I believe we will solve it. We will solve the control problem. And I actually think crypto is already solving the, con- the control problem by developing verifiable, verifiable compute. So if you look at like an orbit planet, what's really fascinating about an orbit planet is everything that an orbit planet computes, it can create a proof that it computed as per the code that you had put in. And so even invisibly, we are developing verifiable compute and and we will be able to uh, put some control into these, these systems. And on the other side, I actually think making highly capable AI open source and distributing this power across many parties is also essential because then humanity can, in a sense, divide and conquer, where you don't want one one highly super intelligent or two highly super intelligent systems in the world that are only managed by 300 programmers each, which is the size of OpenAI. Because if, if only 600 people are going to be managing super intelligences, it's way riskier than 60,000 people managing it or 600,000 people managing it. And, do, and fundamentally, I think we have to open source it, make sure that the world's GPU capacity is being used for artificial intelligence by lots of parties. And we have to, be, we have to ensure that like, the designs for all of these systems are very different. We want them to be heterogeneous. And then we want to use crypto to be able to put in containment measures for this technology who have verifiable compute. And I think that is why the values of open source, uh, wide distribution, and verifiable compute will play an essential role in, in, in this technological area. That's my belief anyway. In the shorter term, do you think that... Um, so in, in the shorter term, do you think that uh, decentralized identity systems protect us from some of the some of the people, some of the things that people are afraid of. So like the disinformation uh, risk that comes with all the generative AI uh, that is like coming to production to product now, you know, like things like stable diffusion, et cetera, and all the video creation uh, algorithms that are, uh, that exist now. Do you think that identity systems can help uh, with, you know, proving that uh, content was created like by a person or, created by an AI, right? Yeah, so I mean, like this is actually uh, this is actually a, a rhyming version of the bigger problem. So the bigger problem is once the software is as intelligent as you are or more than you are, how do you contain it inside some computational box, essentially, right? And, and how do you know that what the outputs you're getting from the computational box are what the system is thinking? That's the... That's the high level problem 10 years from now for humanity. But the the short scale problem, interestingly, is also a problem of verification and cryptography again, where when the cost of producing any piece of content goes down to a dollar, so for a dollar, you could produce any 10 minute movie about anything in the world. It could be a clip of Harry Potter. It could be a clip of uh, Donald Trump talking something. For a dollar, you could, you could produce that. How do you make sure that what you are seeing has been produced by a human on the other side? That's, you see, another cryptography problem. We have to give private keys to every human in the world. That's a problem we are working on. So in a sense, it, it rhymes, doesn't it? Right? Like, so uh, we know how to solve this problem via public-private key cryptography. We are naturally, as a space, building that technology. Even if AI didn't exist, we would build it. But because AI exists, there's enormous incentive to adopt 
private public key cryptography. And I think because AI will get stronger, there'll be enormous incentive to adopt verifiable computation. And I think, yeah, those problems are rhyming and we will manage to solve these problems fundamentally. No one teach AI how to use public private key cryptography then. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Be sure be sure not to teach them how to use it. No no one should give uh no one should give their AI a ledger uh, or connect it to an HSM. Um so barring some AI apocalypse uh, where you know we all disappear, uh what are you most looking forward to in the next ten five hundred episodes? And uh, I guess I guess a bigger question is like how do we keep this going so that we could be here in the next five hundred episodes? Other than Meher, I'm the other uh, eternal optimist. I, in the next say a hundred episodes, I really want to see the stuff we're building kind of hit normal people in a big way. So. I don't want to see them. I don't want to say the mainstream because it doesn't have to be mainstream. But I kind of I wanted to. I want to have products that are built on blockchain technology that are just legitimately fun to use and better to use than uh, the alternatives. And I think this is kind of this is what I this is what I want. Same here. Yeah, and I I I do. I, I'm increasingly I'm thinking that. More and more, I think that like this will come from some combination of gaming slash like social fi applications. I, I do. It's a space that I'm not like I don't have a whole lot of like visibility into, but I do hear a lot of people building infrastructure telling me that they're um, that the market that they're addressing is this gaming and and, uh, and social fi use case, right and. Uh, and that has the potential to bring in like a, a lot of young people, I think. And young people, you know, tend to use technology and sort of adopt technology faster than old people. And so, uh, and it also likes to play games and are very social. So I think that that's a, uh, a decent hypothesis. You're talking like we are not some of them. <laughs> Only Sunny. We have Sunny. We, do have sunny. we have Sunny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would say, aside from maybe like AI generated host that can take some on some episodes. That'd be helpful. Actually on some weeks, on some weeks, I think that would be good if we had an, an AI host. Yeah. We can spice it up and then don't tell people and you have to find out which one was the AI episode. Yeah. Yeah. So what are we doing for episode 1000? What kind of topics will we cover by then? Guesses, courageous guesses. We'll still be questioning mainstream adoption. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Uh, don't say that, Johnny. We'll talk about when, when is it finally going to happen that people use this stuff? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, or are we going to talk with Vitalik about the Ethereum scaling roadmap? <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys think Bitcoin will still feature? Yes. Yes. What about gold? Yes. Yeah. The dollar. Yes. yes. Yeah. Algo stables. Yes. Yeah. I think. I think the. I think the dollar has a has the highest chance of not being around anymore. Except, for, yeah. <laughs> out of those three. Out of those three. <laughs> no, I would put Bitcoin above that. Oh, you put Bitcoin above. Yeah. That? Okay. Yeah, me well, too. Well, gold will still be around for sure. I would, I would, I would put, most chance to stay around is gold, then uh, dollar, then Bitcoin. Okay. Yeah, I agree. So, my. My offbeat uh, idea would be, I think in 10 years, uh, this thing that will become really massive and hopefully bigger than Bitcoin are fundamentally all of the amazing exchange technologies that are being invented in this space. So yes. when I look at, when I look at like what crypto has genuinely done new, I think on the exchange space, we have these automated market makers, one of which Sunny is building, maybe the second or third most popular one of which Sunny is building. We have the badge auction exchange, which is this freakingly amazing exchange technology that replaces market makers with solvers, open source solvers, 
uh, and could result in better prices. Man, that could be amazing. Friederike is involved with that. And then we have the invention of the perpetual, where without having a spot asset, I can go long or short with leverage without having exposure to the spot. And like if you look at like these three technologies, none of them exist in the stock markets, bond markets of the world. And I think the world will realize what amazing, and, and maybe there will be more of these amazing inventions. And I think the world will come to realize that if you want to do cheap transactional cost exchange, you have to go to a crypto network. Very cool. I think that's a good note to end on. Uh, guys, this has been really fun. And uh, I mean, I, when I when I say it's been really fun, I mean, like the last the last 500 episodes have been really fun. And also this one has been really fun. And I really look forward to doing more of these with all of you. Me too. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. See you in 500 episodes. <laughs>